I'm Scott Allen Miller, and this is my life living in Nicaragua. Today I have a note that was sent in by Daniel uh, Barbier, and we're going to read that. We're going to be talking about his comments on San Juan del Sur and why it is the way that it is, how we need to look at it, things that could be better, could be worse, and just a little bit about it. We're going to dig in on a little bit of a different episode today. So let's get to that right after the book. Okay, we're going to start right in reading the comment that he sent in because I wanted to post some responses to this and then I realized it was kind of more than I wanted to type and then no one would see it and I thought his comments were a little bit more important than just having them buried in the in the, in the comment section and uh, I wanted to have my responses uh, seen as well. And before we get into this, I just want to remind everyone that if you have uh, comments or questions or anything, just get down there in the comment section and uh, ask away. That's how we get so much of the content for the show. It really is useful for us. So uh, if you would do that, that would be fantastic. We love getting feedback from you guys. Even if you're just popping in to say hello, that's great too. But of course, if you actually have questions, fantastic. Uh, and of course, you can ask on the live stream. And if you go down to the show notes, all the information is there. Should you want to send in a video and actually get yourself on the show? And uh, you can see I've got a light down there. That really just completely blocks it as I do that. Uh, and you could be on the show and uh, get to be actually seen on YouTube. That would be fantastic. It's very cool for you guys to engage. All right, Daniel writes, and this is, remember, in reference to San Juan del Sur in the south of Nicaragua. Like every paradise place in the world, when the gringos arrive and start real estate, everything uh, is becoming more and more expensive. Speculation is gangrene, and San Juan del Sur, Nicaragua is not spared. Today you have to pay $2 for a small glass of pineapple juice with 50% ice cubes, while a whole pineapple costs 30 cents. $15 a pizza, $2 an espresso coffee, it's more expensive than in Paris. If you want to buy land, you will pay from double up to 10 times the price. It might be cheap compared to the prices in the United States, but this is not the United States. The entire local economy is distorted. To come on vacation and return home, that's no problem, but living here is crazy. A Nicaraguan is paid between five and $10 per day. What justifies such high prices? This atmosphere encourages scams. The special gringo price, 10 times more expensive and little by little, chases away honest locals who can no longer afford to live in their city without defrauding the, the gringos. As you get further out of town, you start to find people living in nailed plank houses with corrugated iron roofs who can't even afford to buy an old bike. There is a lot of poverty in the country. Building houses with sea views for a million dollars does not help the local economy, but reinforces inequalities and the gap between social classes. So San Juan del Sur, for those who are unaware, and this is an important bit of understanding that you have to have, is a uh, resort town of about 15,000 people near the Costa Rican border in the southwest of Nicaragua on the Pacific Ocean. So San Juan del Sur is more than anywhere else in the country a tourist hub. There really is no economy in San Juan del Sur outside of tourism or if you want to include the port as a separate bit of economy, but tourism is the name of the game in San Juan del Sur. Nowhere else in Nicaragua is dominated by tourism in this way. Granada has a big tourist industry, but that is about as close as we can get and there's definitely nothing on par. Once you get outside of Granada, there's nothing even remote to, to being a tourist hub. Um, Ometepe Maybe, but again, very small. And there's actually farming and, and other uh, industries out on Ometepe, whereas San Juan del Sur is completely tourism. Now, San Juan del Sur is special for some historic reasons, which we'll do another episode at some point and go into the history of San Juan del Sur and some other places, because it is quite interesting. I mean, they have a truly interesting history for sure. And uh, part of the waterfront is the way that it is because it's a protected historic zone. So other things to consider in San Juan del Sur. Uh, but uh, in the last maybe 50 years, San Juan del Sur has been the main target of uh, uh, migration into Nicaragua, um, partially because it sits so close to Costa Rica, partially because it's so far from the rest of Nicaragua. And a big piece of the entire puzzle is that San Juan del Sur has the only large protected bay in Nicaragua. That means that if you want calm water as opposed to surf, where you would go out and go surfing on relatively dangerous rocky beaches, San Juan del Sur is your only option in the country. Everything else is going to be surf breaks. 
So that, and it's a large bay, so that idea of a large, very safe, very calm beach is unique down there. And so even for Nicaraguans, it is a spot that is very special and uh, uh, it's just unique within the country. So that is something that has made it a major target for foreigners who lo are looking for a place to invest because even if you're just playing a numerics game and said, well, if, if um, you know, you have 1,000 people moving into Nicaragua and they all want to live on a beach, half of them are going to want a calm beach and half of them are going to want open ocean with rough water. But those who want the rough water have a hundreds and hundreds of miles to choose from and can be spread out over the entire Pacific coast, which is quite large. And those that want calm water are all stuck in one village. And so there, it's a very just math says that you're going to end up with a large concentration of people at San Juan del Sur. It's also a beautiful location. It has some amazing hills and cliffs and mountains within the region. So you get some really interesting uh, geologic uh, layout of the town. So there's lots of reasons that, that people are drawn there. It is a beautiful spot. Absolutely. It's got a lot of unique stuff. It is nice. But it has really turned in, because of the high degree of tourism, it has essentially turned into a giant gringo enclave. And this has created a lot of problems for a lot of reasons. And we're not going to go into every aspect of San Juan del Sur on this video today, but we, I do want to touch on the ones that Daniel was really looking at. So uh, when the gringos arrive and start real estate, everything becomes more and more expensive. So there's a couple things going on. Yeah, there is some really high prices going on in San Juan del Sur, so that's important. And Clearly, when the gringos arrive and start real estate, this is interesting because basically the entire uh, visibility of real estate in Nicaragua, if you were to look at it from outside the country, is all driven by businesses, if you can call them that, in San Juan del Sur, who are presenting things that are supposedly in San Juan del Sur, and, and more or less you see nothing from around the rest of the country. It's not entirely true, there's a little bit, but the amount that San Juan del Sur is demonstrated online in real estate websites and advertising advertising is completely absurd because when you come to Nicaragua, you realize it's a country of 7 million people and San Juan del Sur is a remote fishing village of 15,000 that has now become a tourist hub and the village is not a resort town. It is mostly still a fishing village uh, from a construction standpoint and it is mostly full of backpackers looking for $10 hostel rooms uh, and, and struggling very much because it's the prices of so many things have gone up. So it's a very strange um, kind of dichotomy that so many of the people there are there on a massive budget and those that are uh, staying there have often purchased their homes from abroad and, and didn't do their research and are now stuck in San Juan del Sur having invested without having done their research. Uh, so, so that's a foundation for a lot of the, the way that's the reasons that San Juan del Sur is the way that it is, is because of this trapped gringo phenomenon. He mentions you pay $2 for a little pineapple juice. Yeah, so mostly, uh, so I'm going to mention a couple of things he says about the coffee. That's not that far off from what it is up here. $15 for a pizza, that's high, but again, not that far off from up here. Those are not crazy. Um, but then he says, if you want to buy land, you'll pay double up to 10 per 10 times. So San Juan del Sur does have the highest or nearly the highest real estate in the country. It does have higher demand than other areas. Do you actually pay two to 10 times? Well, that's difficult to say because in, if you were looking at real estate in the United States, you have MLS and you have uh, comps. And when you do that, when you have those tools, you're able to say things like, ah, the land is worth this amount. And you have a really fair idea that it's worth within a very small margin of error about a certain amount. Here in Nicaragua, you don't have that. And so, of course, there's the theory that something's worth whatever someone's willing to pay for it. But in reality, that should be something's worth whatever someone else is always willing to pay for it. It's only worth that amount if you know you can sell it for that in a reasonable amount of time. So if you were to say, my house is worth a million dollars and you put it on the market for a million dollars and no one buys it, it's clearly not worth a million dollars. It's worth something less, but you don't know how much less. But it can't sell in the first minute. It's going to take time. So how long do you wait? This becomes a gray area. But what if the house sits on the market for a week? Okay, if it sells within the week, we probably would all accept that it was worth a million dollars. But what if I had to sit for a year, five years, or 10 years? Would we still agree that it was worth a million dollars or it just waited for someone who's willing to pay what it's not worth? 
It's an interesting problem because what if that person, after having waited 10 years, spending a million dollars on it, then wanted to sell it again? Could they sell it again for a million dollars? If they can't, it demonstrates that just because they overpaid didn't make it that house's value. So there's this problem of what something is worth is not always actually calculatable because just because one person can be tricked into spending a certain amount on something doesn't actually change the market value. You could right now walk into a Walmart, grab a pen off the shelf and spend $20 on it, but it's still $1 pen. Just because you are willing to throw money at something to make a point doesn't change its intrinsic value. So we have this problem in San Juan del Sur that there's so many people saying that things are worth so much money, but what's actually transacting this is not a scene, not, does not appear to be that at all. <clears throat> What we actually see is that things are for sale everywhere and everything's sitting on the market for really long periods of time, demonstrating that the value is actually far less than what people are asking for things. And this is pretty much known. The value in the market right now is very low across all of Nicaragua, but most of Nicaragua has relatively little on the market. The inventory in San Juan del Sur is incredibly high and basically everything's for sale. And a lot of people have just given up because they know that there's no real hope they're competing against so many other similar places that are available. So unless they have something really unique or a reason that they just have to get out, often people are just holding on. So it can be misleading when, when it is possible that the prices of land are a bit higher. But when we were shopping um, and really in earnest talking to people selling places, the prices, yeah, double is probably a realistic number. But much beyond double, even on the sand, we're not finding that here in Nicaragua. We'll find people in San Juan del Sur, you're much more likely to get people who will ask far higher numbers. You will find people who will tell you that they got much higher prices, but what's verifiable is much closer to what you're seeing in the rest of the country. Still higher, but not that far off. Not the, not the orders of magnitude you may be led to believe that it is. Uh, the entire local economy is distorted, absolutely true. Uh, if you're not here on vacation, uh, it doesn't make any sense. Now, there's a little bit here that we do have to kind of go into. He mentions that the Nicaraguans are paid so little, what justifies the high prices? Well, if the real estate is truly as high as it says, which it's not, but if it is, that's going to make the prices very high. It doesn't matter how much your staff makes if your real estate cost is really high. Now, of course, at some point, labor does uh, change the prices, but when I worked even in Manhattan, we, uh, or even in New Jersey, just outside of Manhattan, the cost of our office space for employees who were very highly paid Wall Street employees, it was still more expensive to pay for their annual real estate of their office than it was to pay their salaries, which really shows why they should have been working from home and how bad the bank was at doing basic economics. But the point was that even in the U.S. where labor is super expensive, it's often uh, less expensive than the real estate that someone needs to work in. So here in San Juan del Sur, if the real estate is high, which it's definitely higher than the rest of the country, but the salaries are roughly the same, then you're going to find that the real estate prices are the primary driver of cost and not the uh, employment. So the fact that they're very cheap as, as employees, that the, the daily rates are not that high, it's, that's just going to be reflective as being basically the same as the rest of the country, but the real estate being high will raise the prices significantly. You also have the problem that a lot of people invested uh, at, at times where they were tricked into very high prices and now they're stuck holding things. So even if something cost uh, double or triple today, it may have cost 10 or 20 or 30 times as much when people bought it. So they may be stuck having to pay back loans or cover costs that, that we don't really understand. There's quite a bit of that. And if you're on the waterfront, that's all leased space. So that has its own cost. Uh, it's different than the lease in the rest of uh, the area that we talked about normally where you're leasing from the indigenous community. That's different. On the waterfront in San Juan del Sur, my understanding is that you're leasing from the national government and it's because it has, it's a historic uh, preservation district. Uh, and so it's a little bit different. And basically you don't get to do whatever you want. Uh, this has been a long time and I've only done so much research into it, so don't quote me on this, but it is uh, in theory slightly different than the leases we normally talk about and a lot more restrictive. One of the reasons that we ended up not going into San Juan del Sur could because we easily, in our early days, and I 
warn people, right? I made a lot of these mistakes. I got lucky that a lot of these things fell through and I didn't end up getting screwed, but I was making a lot of these same mistakes that I warned people about. And we almost bought a house in San Juan del Sur. It was a terrible place. We thought we were going to buy it, tear it down or replace it and found out it was on protected land. That's why no one had bought it. And we would have to keep the original structure, which was absolutely useless and worth nothing. And so we almost paid way too much for a place that had no value. And that's something that keeps the values down in San Juan del Sur, is that many of the worst places are protected and there's nothing you can do to remove them. Uh, the, the gringo price, with everything being 10 times more expensive, he's exaggerating here, but it is quite expensive, uh, little by little chases away honest locals who could no longer afford to live in their city. And this, I think, really, I think most people would be surprised to find any locals living in the city. That locals still live there at all is pretty surprising. And if you compare it to places like uh, the, the hotel district in Cancun, to Isla Mujeres, to uh, parts of Florida where you have, you know, absolute resort areas, the resort areas around Disney World, we would be surprised if American locals were living there anymore either. So when you have a town that has dedicated itself intentionally or accidentally to being a resort town, you kind of have to assume that locals are going to be driven out. Nowhere in the world can locals or normal people afford to live in a tourist zone, nor in most cases do people want to. It's the worst place to live for most people. But there are people who really like that vibe. And so there's people who move to Florida, people who move to uh, Marbella, people who move to San Juan del Sur, because these are places that they actually enjoy. It's just the average person does not. The average person is like, ooh, I don't, I like to visit, but I don't want to live. But there's, there are people who are like, I want to live the resort lifestyle every day. And that's, then they have this kind of place as an option for that. Now, another thing we have to address when we're talking about San Juan del Sur and the prices down there is that this is a tourist zone. So basically all the businesses that you're going to be dealing with, restaurants, hotels, activities, those sorts of things, bars, all of these things are catering to tourists. And so their pricing structure is based around what they can get from a tourist. And in, in any tourist zone anywhere in the world, you're going to have these, these inflated prices and, and lower quality because they're just, they're dealing with people who are not going to be return customers. They have no reasonable possibility of these people coming back and becoming customers again. So because they're one timers and they're there on vacation, like we, we just accept the world over. And this is where something like Paris is different, uh, that we're dealing with high prices because we're in a tourist zone. So in a place like Paris, you can't rely on tourism because you have an unlimitedly large city. And if someone said, well, the price is really high at this restaurant, they would just go on to the next one. And if that one didn't, then the next one. But in San Juan del Sur, or like Disney World, you have a completely tourist economy. And so you can't go on to the next place. There's only 20 or 30 or 40 restaurants, and they all are going to make their money by catering to tourists. If they catered to the locals, they would make a fraction of the money. Uh, it, it just doesn't work. So even if you can keep the prices down in some way, if you were able to operate more cheaply, you'd be asking businesses not to make profit that they're trying to make. And so that fundamentally just isn't going to work. They would never voluntarily do that. So that's not going to happen. So that keeps the prices really high because you're living in a dedicated tourist zone. That's why Leon, Granada, places like that, you'll find pockets where the prices are slightly higher. If you're on the Calzada in, in Granada, yes, you're gonna pay 10, 20, maybe 30% higher prices than being off the Calzada uh, for the same food, for the same types of restaurants, but it's a relatively small fee and that fee is universal to that zone. Everybody, you can easily step off that zone. So people who want that view or want to be in the midst of that, they will pay that little bit extra. And those who want a little bit cheaper meal will just step off and go another block or two away and they can do so. That works because the numbers aren't crazy and there's a large selection and it's because they're specifically offering a view or whatever, just like a waterfront restaurant is going to have a higher price than someone across the street who's not waterfront. But they can only go so high because they can only be basically charging for the view. They can't charge for having an isolated or trapped audience. So that has a lot to do with why the prices are so high. And of course, it's because there's so many tourists, but it's not the gringos who have bought in town that are really creating that problem because they will shop around, presumably, but many 
didn't shop around to become trapped. And once they're trapped, if they're able to pay those high prices, they're going to get stuck paying them because why would anyone lower the prices? It's a trapped audience. So there just isn't any competition uh, large enough to, to create a market pressure to for someone to sneak in with a lower cost. Well, I'm going to sneak in. I'm going to open a restaurant and it's going to cost way less than everyone else and I'll be really busy. Yeah, you will, but the other restaurants will still make more money than you. Why would you do that? You're going to be donating all that time and effort because if you just charge high prices like everyone else, you do half as much uh, business and still earn more profits. So the, there's things that keep them out of that. So uh, mostly it's the tourists that really prop that up, the nonstop stream of people who come because there's so much advertising for it. Those that chose to live there are just kind of stuck in, and the very few Nicaraguans who uh, did not intentionally make it home but were born there, it's just unfortunate that they're in a spot where a lot of those things just are super expensive, um, and that's a, that's a cost of gentrification anywhere, that that's always a possibility that you're going to end up getting priced out of your own uh, original home. But it does mean, in theory, that they can sell their home, sell their land, make far more, move to another community, and get way more uh, for for their, their sale. So in theory, if they're able to get twice as much as they normally would, that means they can sell a lot for you know X amount of dollars in San Juan del Sur, and in theory, buy one twice as big uh, in another town, or buy two equal in two different towns, or whatever. They just have a lot more resources because of that. So it's not all negative, but having to move to a different town just because you can't afford to stay where you are is difficult. Now, of course, if they already own, already live in town, a lot of those things, they're not going out to restaurants. They're just going to, to Pali and getting their groceries and going to the local market. And they're still feeling some of that higher price, but very minimally. I don't think it's as bad as it seems. I think more people are getting out of town because their opportunities are best if you get out of town because you can sell your land, get that extra high price uh, and, and take advantage of that because at some point that could collapse as it has. And at one point they could have made far more than they can now and people are sometimes just looking for a way to, to make that return. Um, they don't want to live with, uh, without it. Um, he says as you get farther out of town, basically you come on the, the same poverty-stricken areas that you would have anywhere. Uh, that pretty much goes without saying. There is a lot of poverty in the country. That is true. Uh, it's also true that poverty is very different in Nicaragua. That's an important thing to remember, that when you're looking at poverty in, say, the United States or Canada, I just talked to some people, and, you know, of course, some of this is politicians, but a lot of Canadians are talking about serious starvation and, and soup kitchens and uh, trying to deal with homeless shelters and that kind of stuff, and Nicaragua doesn't have that. Right. We don't need soup kitchens. We don't need homeless shelters because we really don't have homeless. Like these things are actually being handled. And so it, it begs the question of, well, yes, Nicaragua has more people who are poor, but Canada, it seems, has more people who are destitute, who are truly in danger from poverty. So it, it's an odd uh, or difficult question to ask and answer because um, we see much more dramatic poverty in North America than we do in Nicaragua, but obviously Nicaragua has far less income and more people struggling. But I think my personal opinion is those who are truly struggling to put food on the table uh, in Nicaragua are generally making it. They're struggling and doing it. And I think in the US and Canada, the number who are struggling and not doing it is higher. Uh, but that's obviously an absolute number is, of course, there's more people starving in the United States than there are people in Nicaragua, right, just because the, the orders of magnitude larger. But I, I really believe that when you're in the United States, the visible poverty, the true poverty, not the you have a house I don't like and not the you don't own a TV and do like not irrelevant things. The U.S. has a tendency and, and people who live in, in these areas have a tendency towards looking at really weird things as indicators of poverty. But really poverty should be primarily looked at as safety, food, shelter, health care. And the number of Nicaraguans who are lacking those things, they may be very, very close to the line. But those who are lacking those things and having to skip meals and not being able to eat is relatively low, I think, compared to the United States, where lots of people are choosing that they can't eat or whatever. But they may be able to afford a television because they have an old one that someone is going to throw away. The United States has many more 
things. And so often you end up with things even though you're way below the poverty line. Whereas in Nicaragua, there aren't so many things. And so if you're anywhere close to a poverty line, you probably don't have them because those aren't the things you're prioritizing and they're just more expensive by comparison. So it, those types of uh, uh, comparisons can be very difficult because it may be observably feel much poorer in Nicaragua, but when you actually put the tires to the road and say, oh, but do they get the things that they need? Oh, yes, in Nicaragua, we have public Wi-Fi for internet. We have all these, you know, free healthcare, you know, Nicaraguans who are below the poverty line may be getting health care that is equal to or better than someone who is middle income in the United States. Now, if you're super rich in the U.S., probably you're getting better. Probably. But if you're super rich in Nicaragua, I'm pretty confident you get better there. Right. So uh, it, it, it depends. But these things are very difficult to compare because it's two wildly different situations. And you can't just look at a number uh, and make a determination. Um, for example, someone posted just the other day, uh, X number of Nicaraguans are below the poverty line. But the number was absurd. It was some no it was an impossible number. And if you use a American guide to poverty, then yes, maybe below the American poverty line in the United States, making only, let's say, $8,000 a year would make you abjectly poor. But making that same money in Nicaragua, you'd be looking at maybe just getting close to being middle class. You're still going to be poor, but you're maybe getting close to middle class. It's a completely different thing. He then says building houses with sea views for a million dollars does not help the local economy. It actually does a little bit. Um, there's a lot of construction of materials and labor that goes into those. That stuff does actually help, but in the long run, the act of people living in those places generally does not help the economy. Generally, uh, they end up being just so far apart, so separated. If you were building those places in the middle, of the city and actively being part of a community and it just happens to be that you're building a really big home but you're still participating, I think you're fine. It's if you're building those things and then setting yourself apart. The thing that I believe does the most damage is the enclave mentality, whether it's actual enclaves or just the approach of that. But when we think of ourselves as being set apart, then it creates these divides and, and strange economic conditions uh, that cause a lot of problems. So. San Juan Sur is a challenge because it is so different than the rest of the country. There is no precedence for it within the country. It is uh, constantly a problem. Now, I do want to I want to touch on one last thing uh, before the end of today's video, and that is uh, he says that the situation creates this need for scams, and he mentions the the gringo scams, meaning the the gringo pricing on everything, and you pay way more than you should, and uh, just makes things very expensive, and that does happen. Like, why would locals not charge you extra because you're already paying extra for everything else? Why should they not get to take advantage of it? They should, so they do. But it also because of the way that things happen in San Juan del Sur, because of people getting lured in, because it's the place you go when you don't do your research, because you get there thinking it's going to be Nicaragua, and then you find out it's an enclave and it's a tourist hub and everything, every number you've heard is off, everything, just nothing makes sense. The economy doesn't work the way you expect it because it's, you're not, your people move there thinking Nicaragua, and then they get there and they're like, oh, you know, all of Nicaragua is like, that's not what Nicaragua is like. That is a clear enclave in a tourist zone. Like, it's a totally different thing. When we're looking at the foreigners who come and end up in that situation, I think many of them end up in the same boat. Everything's much more expensive than they were anticipating. The prices keep going up. Uh, they're, they're very much positioned to be taken advantage of. That makes them very vulnerable. They, in turn, also, because they, they, they can't be employed, they may come here a lot, come here, they don't do their research, they think they can just get a job, they think they can just do all these different things. No, you have to You have to think these things through, you have to use some logic and common sense here and not think that you're actually just moving to another state and so many of them end up destitute or looking at, at serious poverty or not being able to pay their bills or not being able to stay and they in turn also turn to scams and, and looking for ways to fleece other foreigners because that's where all the money is. And so if they want to pay their bills, they want to be able to keep living in a place that, that they weren't prepared for or were lured into, they often will, will turn to that as well. And so we see this culture there on both sides. Every, every tourist coming through is seen as a walking pocketbook uh, by, by absolutely just, just all the time. Um, and that is that is what we see. So that is uh, Daniel's post. Uh, mostly, we just wanted to read it, but I thought it was a good one. Um, and uh, 
wanted to get caught up a little bit on the videos because we had so much going on as always. Like and subscribe. If you'd like to help support the channel, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. And uh, if you'd be so kind as to share on social media, tell your friends about the show, tell a family member, get someone hooked, let them know uh, about all the information we have here. And I will see all of you tomorrow. And I'll do my best. Click on one of these videos. I'd really appreciate it.